Hi, and welcome to 2023 AP Teacher Week. My name is Claire Lorenz, and I work on the AP instruction team in the AP program. Over the next several sessions of this video series, we'll discuss AP's online platform called AP Classroom and all of the instructional resources available to support teaching and learning in your classroom. In this second video, we'll look at how AP Daily, Topic Questions, and Progress Checks can help support instruction in your classroom. Here's a brief look at the agenda that we'll be covering today. First, we'll do a quick overview of the resources that we'll be discussing today. That's AP Daily, Topic Questions, and Progress Checks. We'll go over what they are and when you might want to use them with students. Then we'll go live into AP Classroom so that you can see where you might find these resources and how you might want to assign them to students. And then we'll come back to our PowerPoint point and discuss key takeaways and the major points that you'll want to leave this session with. So we'll start with our resource overview. If you've watched the first session, you probably heard discussion about AP resources in general and how all of the AP resources are meant to support teaching and learning at each stage of the instructional cycle. So whether you are planning, teaching, having students practice what they've learned, assessing, getting or giving feedback to students, or reviewing and preparing for the AP exam, there are resources within AP Classroom that will help you at each stage of the teaching and learning cycle. During this video, we are going to focus largely on the teaching, practicing, and assessing stages. So we're going to be looking at AP Daily videos, topic questions, and progress checks. First, we'll start with AP Daily. So AP Daily, what is it? AP Daily is a series of on-demand short videos that teachers can assign to students, saving direct class time to focus on areas where students need help. These videos are meant to support student learning of the topics and skills for every unit of the course. That is, AP Daily videos exist for every topic and every skill in every course. They're available for all courses and all students, including students in exam only sections. So if you have students who are self-studying for an exam and they are not currently enrolled in an AP course in your school, students will still be able to have access to the AP daily videos to help them prepare for the AP exam. These videos are always visible to students regardless of whether teachers have assigned them. So starting from day one of their enrollment in an AP classroom section, students will be able to see all of the AP daily videos available for the course that they are enrolled in. So they can start watching AP daily videos right away. Students can kind of get ahead if they want to, or they can start reviewing at any time that they want to during the school year. There are also a accompanying review videos for particular courses based on review sessions that were held in previous years. So students who want to look at review videos from previous years, you may be familiar with certain sessions called AP Daily Practice Sessions or AP Daily Live Review. We've carried those sessions over in AP Classroom so that students and teachers can make use of them throughout the school year. And we'll show you where you can find those in AP Classroom. So how should you use AP Daily with your students? Well, you can have students watch AP Daily videos in class as homework for additional practice or review. And the videos can be used to either introduce new content and skills, complement direct instruction, reinforce concepts after class, and teachers can track student completion rates by class and student on AP Classroom. I'll come over here to this side and you'll be able to see, and we'll go over this a little bit more once we get into AP Classroom, but you'll see as you assign a video to a particular 
particular period or class section, you'll see the a designation that video has been assigned. And as students start to watch video, they will go from the unwatched list to the watched list. And the percentage of your class that has watched the video will start to increase. And teachers can also search transcripts for specific key concepts to review with students. So if you decide you don't need students to watch the full video, you can have them actually just watch portions of the video that are most pertinent to the concepts that you think that they need to focus on the most. So again, there's no right or wrong way to use AP Daily videos. You should use them in the way that make the most sense for you and your students, whether that means watching them before they come to class and you do direct instruction or watching them after class class after you've taught a particular lesson or even during class as a way to kind of pause and review what has been taught so far. It's entirely up to you about how you use AP Daily. The next resource is topic questions. So we'll start again. Topic questions, what are they? So topic questions are formative assessment questions that help diagnose student understanding for each course topic. That's why they're called topic questions. They provide students with practice applying the content and skills for each topic within a unit. If you remember at the very beginning of this video, we talked about the stages of the instructional cycle and topic questions were aligned with that practice stage. So topic questions are going to give students that opportunity to practice what they have learned so far as it relates to each topic within a course unit. They enable you as a teacher to check for understanding early and often to inform individual and class level support. So these topic questions will give you the data and information that you need to figure out what students understand and where you may need to double down on additional instruction or support. So in that way, we say that topic questions provide just-in-time feedback to teachers to help you identify a common student misunderstanding. So if you're looking at the results of topic questions and you see that students have picked the same distractor or the same incorrect answer, you'll be able to understand that students may have a particular misconception and you'll be able to kind of address that misconception before moving on to the next topic or the next concept in the course. At the same time, topic questions also provide this just-in-time feedback to students because topic questions also have rationales for multiple choice question responses. That means that when students do these questions online, students will be shown what the correct answer is and what the reasoning for why that correct answer is the correct answer. They will also be told why an incorrect answer is an incorrect answer. And after they have submitted their assignment, they will be shown what the correct answer is and what the reason is for that answer being the correct answer. So there's a lot of opportunity here for students to take ownership of their own learning as well. So how should you use topic questions in your classroom? Well, again, topic questions, just like AP Daily, can be used before, during, or after instruction. Topic questions are housed in the question bank because they can be assembled in a variety of different ways. Unlike the progress checks, which we'll talk about next, topic questions can be used as like single questions or you can put them together as groups of questions. And because you have the freedom to group them together as you best see fit, they live in the question bank so that you kind of can create the assignment that works best for your students. We're not going to talk a lot about the question bank today. That'll be in the next session. So we encourage you to kind of hold on and watch for session number three, where we'll talk in much greater detail about the question 
question bank. Topic questions can be used for a variety of different reasons. They can be used as warm-up questions, homework exercises, exit ticket questions, or even in conjunction with AP Daily videos. Some teachers have told us that they have students watch AP Daily videos, and then they use the topic questions as a means to assess what students have learned from the content and skills that they've taken away from the AP Daily videos. But in general, teachers use them to check for understanding after direct instruction. Sometimes you may have students even read something ahead of class and use the topic questions as a means to diagnose what students understand before they come to class so that you know what you may need to really focus on during direct instruction so that you really spend your time where students need it the most. There's no right or wrong way to use topic questions, just as like there's no right or wrong way to use AP Daily videos. It really is up to you. You know your students the best. So you have the freedom to use topic questions in a way that really gives you what you need for your students. And finally, progress checks. So progress checks are unit level formative assessment opportunities that have multiple choice and free response questions that assess students' progress in learning content and skills for each unit. So you will see them typically at the end of each unit. Progress checks were designed to provide teachers with the opportunity to get feedback on student progress through a unit and then allow you to see longitudinal progress of students from unit to unit. At the same time, just like topic questions, the progress checks will also give feedback to students on their progress, allowing them to see their areas of strength and areas where they may need additional study. So once again, like topic questions, progress checks will allow students to sort of take ownership of their own learning and kind of really see areas where they need to focus more. Over here, you'll see an example of a progress check question. We'll dig into this more as we get into AP Classroom itself, but how should progress checks be assigned? It's important to note that topic questions are formative assessment questions, and they're meant to be used as each topic is taught. Progress checks are formative assessments, and they are meant to be used at the end of each unit, so as each unit is taught. So you have the topic questions that help you assess student understanding at the end of each topic, and then progress checks to help you assess student understanding at the end of each unit. Just like topic questions, progress checks can be given in class or for homework, and they typically come in two sections. There is multiple choice and free response. It's important to note that while topic questions can be assembled in any way that you would like, for progress checks, questions within each section hold together as a form. That means that you cannot disaggregate them. You cannot separate the questions in a progress check. You can't decide, oh, I only want questions one, five, and nine, and that's all I want. And I'll just, I want to extract them from the progress check. You have to give all of the questions in the progress check if you want to give any of the questions. But you'll be able to kind of decide how you want to assign these to students. So free response questions can be completed online or in print. Multiple choice question sections must be completed online. And the reason that we do that is for two reasons. One, we want you to be able to see the data from students right away. If we didn't do that and students completed this on paper, you would not have the robust data and the reporting, which we will look at in session number four, that would be available to you to help drive some of the instructional decision making that would come after looking at student data. But also, students doing the multiple choice questions online allows them to see the rationales for correct and incorrect answers. If they did this on paper, they would not be able to see all of that information and would not have the power that it does with them doing it online. And I'll say really briefly that progress checks are formative assessments. They are meant to be learning experiences, and they are meant to be low stakes assessments. As such, they cannot be used to assign letter grades to students. 
If you want to read more about this, we would encourage you to read the AP resources and support section of the AP course and exam description. This is part of the very front section of every AP course and exam description or the CED. Basically, what this means is that we don't want teachers giving an accuracy grade for progress checks. So this particular progress check has a certain number of questions. If students answered half the number of questions correctly. We don't want teachers averaging in a 50% into a student's course grade. However, we understand that you need to give students grades. So teachers have done a variety of different things here. They've given students participation grades. They've given students homework grades. They've done very creative things like having students do sort of their own test corrections and grading those. They've done some sort of peer review type of exercises, graded those. They've had students create their own questions based on the questions that they've answered incorrectly and given those grades. So there's a lot of different things that teachers have done here to be able to give grades related to the progress checks. But the idea here is that progress checks are formative assessments and formative assessments were meant to be learning experiences rather than summative assessment, you know, four grade type of experiences. Before we go over to AP Classroom itself, I do want to make a plug for more information about AP Classroom. You can go over to two of our newly redesigned web pages over on AP Central, which is AP's main hub for all things AP. If you want to learn a little bit more about all things AP Classroom, you can go over to our main web page by scanning this first QR code. If you want an overview of all of the instructional resources and hear a little bit more again about how each can be used in your classroom, you'll want to look at this second web page here, which you can get to by scanning this second QR code. Okay. And with that, we will go over to AP Classroom. Okay, so we're going to start by going to myap.collegeboard.org. That's myap.collegeboard.org. And we are going to click educator account and we are going to sign in with your username and password. You'll use your username and password and then click next. Okay, and you'll land on what we call a personalized homepage of AP Central, otherwise known as My AP. And you should see AP Central up here. You'll see the normal menu options for AP Central. You'll see your name. You'll see your high school this is a fictitious high school for me. And then the current academic year. You'll usually see any current kind of news announcements here. You'll see some commonly used links on the right-hand side. You can get to the course audit from here, the AP teacher community, exam scores if you've taught AP in the past, professional learning experiences, and, and other commonly used resources here. And then you are going to see some course cards for the courses that you teach since we're talking about math and computer science, I'm going to use Calculus AB as our model course for this session. So I'm going to click on Go to AP Classroom. Okay, and so you will have landed here on our homepage for AP Classroom. AP Classroom always defaults to the last page that you were on. We're going to start by talking about AP Daily videos. So. There are several ways that you can access a lot of the resources that we're going to talk about today. With AP Daily videos, that is true of them. The first way that you can access AP Daily videos is by accessing them by the topic to which they are aligned. So I'm going to date myself a little bit here, and I'm going to hope that most of you on the other end of this video are going to know what I'm talking about. But when I think about the list of topics for a particular course, I think about the list of topics as what I would call a card catalog from a library. 
was younger and needed to do a report for school, you go to the library and you would look up particular books that you would need in the card catalog and figure out where to find them on the shelves of the library. And so the card catalog drawer kind of housed all of the resources that were available like in that drawer. And so I kind of think of each topic as a drawer that houses the resources that are available for that particular topic. So in this particular case, if I want to see the resources that are available for topic 1.3, I can click on this drawer and I will see all of the all of the resources that are available for this particular topic. Now we're going to start by talking about AP Daily videos. So you'll see some other things here, topic questions. Some courses have things called other resources, some don't. But we're going to focus on AP Daily videos at the moment. AP Daily videos, they're usually anywhere from one to three videos per topic. How many there are typically depends on the complexity of the topic and or how long a teacher would typically spend teaching this topic to their students. And you can read what each individual video is about by reading the description that is right next to the video number. Now you can assign all the videos to your students at once if you'd like, or you can assign each individual video separately. Maybe you want your students to watch the first video. Maybe you only want them to watch the second video. Maybe you want them to watch the first and the third one. You are free to decide how to use these AP Daily videos as you see fit for your students. Maybe you decided you want to see a little bit about these videos before you determine whether or not you want to assign them to your class. So I'm going to click on daily video one here for topic 1.3, and that's going to bring up topic 1.3 daily video one. You're going to see the topic number and the name of the topic, as well as that same video description. You'll see the teacher in the upper right hand corner, and you will see a couple of other options available. If you look at the bottom right hand corner of the player bar, Students can actually choose to watch the video at a higher speed, their accessibility features, and then there's a closed captioning menu. One of the really great things about this is that if you start playing the video, the video will obviously start to play here and you'll see the video start to progress. And if you turn on the closed captioning, you will see the captioning come up at the bottom, which is super helpful for students who might require this as an accommodation, or if you have students who just prefer to kind of be able to read along as they're listening. If you click here again and you click search video, one of the things that you can do is that will bring up a searchable transcript. And you'll notice that this bar along the left-hand side will scroll down the page as the teacher is talking and will follow along as the video progresses. But one of the things that I really like about this is that you can actually search here for something very specific. So if I wanted to search for, let's say the word limit, the word limit comes up here 29 times. I'm not surprised to see that. Let's say maybe I want a, even a term and I say evaluating limits. I could see like it comes up or evaluating a limit. I can see even evaluating the limit comes up here or just even evaluating that comes up twice. I can actually jump to a particular part of the video that contains that particular word. If I want, I can click there and it will jump to that part of the video. I Let me go back to the word, let's just say limits here. That's six, only six times. I could hit enter and it will continue to scroll through. You can see this number here, advance. And let's say the fifth time, here's this. I can actually click here and watch what happens to the player. Right now it's at 20 seconds, but if I click here, 
it's actually going to go all the way to the end of the video. So if I really want to focus on something at the end of the video, I can actually click here and it will take students there. And I can tell students, hey, watch from 1026 all the way from the end of the video for a summary of what this video is about. And then you can determine if you want to go back and watch some of the video. So there's a way for you to kind of home in and figure out if there are specific parts of the video that you want students to watch so that you can really target instruction here and use the videos to cover very specific concepts rather than just blanketly telling students, hey, watch the video. So you're free to use the videos in a way that makes the most sense for your students. Now, you can assign the videos to your students. Students can see these without you assigning them, and you can explicitly assign the videos to your students. So I can click assign here, and I have some options. So you can see I have three sections here. I've labeled them periods one, two, and three. I can assign this video to a single class period if I want. I could also assign it to a class period, but I could assign it to specific students in a class period. So let's say I'm assigning it to period one for homework, but period two might be a little bit ahead. But on the day that I taught this particular lesson, let's say Brian, Marie, and Margaret were absent. So I want them to watch this entire video explicitly. And then period three, we're just not there yet. Let's say we're still on topic 1.2. I can assigned to this mix of students. I can have a start date and a due date if I want. I don't have to send a due date if I don't want to. I can copy a shareable link to this video that I can put into my learning management system, my LMS, whether that's Canvas, Google Classroom, Schoology, something else. And then I can click assign to, and this will go to my students. And you can see now that two new video assignments were created and this has now changed to a green assigned. If I click here, it will say 0% watch. That makes sense because nobody's watched it yet. I've just assigned it. But you can see here that I have a little icon now next to period one because I've assigned it to this whole class. I've also assigned it to some of the students in period two. So I'll see the icon there. And I've not assigned it to period three. So I don't see an icon there. However, if students in period three were to start watching on their own because they can access this on their own, they would start to move from the unwatched list to the watched list. So in other words, as students start to watch, they would move from this list over to this side. I have an example of that. So let me actually close here and go up to topic 1.1, where I've already assigned a video and we'll click into 1.1 daily video one. Okay. And here you'll see that 3% of my class has watched the video. So I'm going to click here and you can see here, I've only assigned this to my period one class. I can expand here and I can see out of my class of 20 students, two of them have watched the video. Now by watched, we mean that students have watched at least 95% of the video or more. And by watched, we mean that they have let the video play, whether that's on regular speed, half speed or double speed, but they've let the video play for 95% of the video. Now, when I say let the video play, what I mean is, is that they literally have let the video play. Right now, if I press play, the video is actually playing. I could change the speed to double speed, but the video is still playing. I'm letting the video play all the way through. If the student is doing what we call scrubbing the video and they do one of these and they scroll kind of all the way through, this is not letting the video player play. This does not count as having watched the video. Even if they scroll it all the way through, that is not having watched the entire video. So that will not count. So there's a chance that students have done that and then they're not going to come up on this list. So you can actually see how much of a video that students have 
watch. Let me show you how to do that. So I can close out of here and I can actually go over to resources and assignments and I can go to assigned resources and assigned resources is going to show me everything that I've assigned to students. We've only talked about AP daily videos so far. So I'm really just going to go over to videos at the moment. And you can see the one that I just assigned to students. I assigned it to period one and then those three students in period two, which I can click on and be reminded who those three students are. But you can see over here, I was just looking at 1.1 daily video one. And I said that there were only two students on that list that actually had watched the video, but I can see there's actually six other students who started watching the video and I can click here and I can actually see here, Edith and Jack who came up on my list of having watched the video, but then there are six other students who had started watching the video and I can actually see what percentage of the video they watched. So they won't come up on the having watched the whole video or 95% of the video or more, but it will tell me what percentage of the video that they actually watched. So you will have these numbers to be able to tell how much of a video students have watched. So it's a way for you to kind of keep track of student progress, even though they haven't completely watched the video. Let's go back to our course guide here. And we talked about multiple ways for you to access the videos. One of them was to go topic by topic. Another way for you to do that is to click on this video tab right here, and you can actually see all of the videos and just the videos for a particular unit. You can see all the ones that I've assigned, they come up in green, and all the ones I haven't assigned, they don't come up in green. And I can choose to assign all the videos for a particular topic. If you click that, it will say literally each individual video and it will sign multiple at the same time. So it saves you from having to do these individually, or I can just choose to assign an individual video or one video at a time. So that's the second way you can choose to assign videos. If you happen to not teach the course in the order in which we display in the course and exam description, you can get a full catalog of all of the resources that are available through the resources and assignments tab. Before I was on assigned resources, where I look at the things that I've actually assigned to my students, but I can also just look at all resources and I can get a catalog listing of all of the resources that exist in AP Classroom by resource type. So I can go over to videos and I can literally see every single video that is available without me having to like go by course topic or course unit and go from unit to topic to whatever. I could just get a full listing here and scroll by page. I can also filter by whether or not I've assigned the resource or I haven't assigned the resource. And I can see here whether or not I've assigned it. I can preview it from here. I can also do things like label the video from here, which we'll look at in the question bank video as well. So that is really AP daily videos. I'll make one more plug here, and that is for the review videos. And if you go to the review videos, you will see all of the on-demand review videos that have been created for the past three years. So that's AP daily videos. So let's talk now a little bit about topic questions. So I'm going to go back to my drawer on topic 1.3 here, and I am going to look at my topic questions. So my topic questions, typically they're going to range somewhere between three and six topic questions per course, per topic. Most courses have about three per topic. Calculus folks are going to usually see six, mostly because given you access to A, B questions, and then a B, C set. But since the content is the same in the earlier units, you're going to see six at one time. So that's why you see a few more here. But you can assign these questions all at the same time if you want, or you can assign them individually, or you can assign a group of them, a subset of them at one time. You can hover over each question to see what the question is about. 
and you can kind of scroll through that hover to see what the correct answer is as well. So you don't actually have to click on anything and wait for a page to load in order to figure out what the question is about. So that is super helpful, especially if you know, you're working at school and internet access sometimes may not be as strong as you would like it to be. Something to consider there as well. However, if you want to see a little bit more information about the question, I would encourage you to click on the question because you'll get a wealth of additional information that can be helpful for you to understand how these topic questions really work. So here's the actual question. And right now it'll appear like you're getting less information because you don't even see the answer. The most powerful thing here is this side panel. And if you click on the side panel, you are going to see that correct answer come up. And if you scroll, you're going to see the rationale for that correct answer. If you click around and you click on an incorrect answer, you're going to see that it's an incorrect answer. And you're also going to see the rationale for that incorrect answer. So if you have students do these questions online, once they submit their responses for all of the questions that you put on one assessment for them, they're going to be told that the answer to this is incorrect. They're going to be given the rationale for why it is incorrect. And then they're going to be able to see what the correct answer is. And they can click on that correct answer and then read why the correct answer is correct. And we allow for all of this so that hopefully it will save you time in the classroom so that you don't have to go over every single question. Again, give students the opportunity to really kind of like own their own learning and figure out where they need to concentrate on and provide maybe some additional study time. The other thing here is that you will see that it's aligned to topic 1.3 on estimating limit values from graphs. And you can see how the question actually aligns to that, right? There's a graph. We're talking about limit values in this particular question, for those of you who are familiar with calculus. But then you'll be able to see what skill this is aligned to. And if you saw on the previous page, you know, the skill that is aligned to topic 1.3 for this course is skill 2B. And Skill 2B says identify mathematical information from a graphical, numerical, analytical, or verbal representation. And that's exactly what's going on here. So in this particular question, I'm not surprised to see some sort of representation that I have to extract information from in order to answer a question. So if we're suggesting that you teach a particular topic with a particular skill, then we're going to give you these topic questions that allow you to assess whether or not students can apply this skill within the context of this topic's content. So the topic questions were created with this very specific agenda in mind, and that is that if you're teaching this topic skill pairing, we're going to give you questions that are going to assess this topic and this skill together. And all of the questions here are going to do exactly that same thing. So all of these questions are going to be aligned to this topic 1.3 and skill 2B. And they're, they'll all look slightly different, but they're all going to encompass estimating limit values from graphs and identifying mathematical information from some sort of representation. So just something, if you don't teach calculus and you're looking at, you know, computer science, science or you're looking at statistics, you should see the same type of alignment with your questions and your questions and your topic skill pairing that you have there. So you can choose to create an assignment from here, or you can X back out of here. And what you can do is you can say, hey, I want to make my own, let's say, exit slip or a ticket for the day. And I am going to say, you know what? Okay. I like this question and I'm going to add this question to an assignment. And I want to say, let's say this is, I don't want to call it a quiz. Let's say I call this, we use the word quiz a lot because it's a short four letter word that fits in a lot of places. So let's say I call this topic 1.3 and I'm going to call this 
like exit ticket. Let's say I call it number two. Let's say I have, this is the second day that I'm teaching this for whatever reason. And I can have just this one question on this if I want. I can also come back to all questions and I can see what else I may want to put on here. Looks like I've already assigned these other ones. These, maybe I want to add this question as well. I could also hover and figure out what it is. Maybe I don't want that one. I can just unclick. Maybe I want this one instead. It looks a little bit more complex. If this is the second day that I'm doing this one, I can add this. You can notice as I click to add, my number now changes to two. If I don't want this question, I can click it again. It goes back to one. You click it to add it back. It goes to two. I can go back to this tab and I can reorder the questions if I want. And then I could click save. If this is an exit ticket, I don't want a lot of questions on it. I don't have to use all six topic questions at one time. I could reuse ones I've already used and I can assign this from here. And I could say, you know what? Let me assign this to my period two class, let's say. And I am going to sign it online to my, so my students can see the rationales. I am not going to have a due date. Maybe I put a timer and I can say students have five minutes to do this. Notice it'll say here students will be notified before they start this assignment to ensure that they have enough time. But once the timer is up, students are notified, but they can continue working unless you set the due date and time to enforce it. So in other words, students are going to be told after the end of five minutes that five minutes is up, but they will not be locked out of the assignment. So it's more of an instructional tool. We do that so that you can take into account students that have an accommodation of extended time. If you want to lock students out, you would have to set the due date for five minutes from the start time. So if I want to lock students out after five minutes, I would have to literally set this for 7.17 at 2.48 p.m., which I can do if I want to, or I can just set it as no due date and just give like kind of a, an instructional like kind of warning at the end of five minutes. It's, it's totally up to you and how you want to work with your class. So then I can click assign and I can go to manage assignment if I want. And what you'll see here is kind of as students start to submit, you'll be able to see students working and who started, who has not started, the date that they submitted, et cetera. And then I can kind of go back and I can look at other questions that I've used before, but I can also go to my resources and assignments and I can go to my assigned resources and I can look to see this is the last thing that I've assigned here. I can also sort by the assignments that I've made from the question bank, whether they contain topic questions or other things, and I'll be able to see progress so far. So I can see what my period two class has done so far. I can sort this by what's active, what's complete. And again, when a period class has completed something, you can see I've assigned things on topic 1.3 before to my period two class. I can literally click here and I can see the results. I can see right the first time around, a lot of my students did not do well the first time around. So maybe it's good that I have been assigning more questions on topic 1.3. So we'll talk a little bit more in video four about interpreting student data and how we can find out more information um, after viewing more detailed results. So these are topic questions. I will say that you can also access all the topic questions from a unit by clicking on topic questions here, and you can see all of the topic questions in a particular unit. You can also, just like we did with the videos, go to all resources. And if you've created topic question quizzes in the past or assignments, you can see things that you have created before. 
So you can see anything that you've created and assigned before, including things you may have assigned years ago. Here's something that I created back in 2020 and it's still here. I've not assigned it to anyone, this, any class this particular year, and I can choose to either assign it. I can look at it to see what's on it, um, or I can completely delete it if I wanted to, because I decided I don't have a, a use for it anymore. So there's a lot of different choices that I have here if I want to kind of clean up my list of assignments that I've made over the years. Okay, let's go back. Finally, we will talk about progress checks really quickly. At the end of every single unit, and some units are longer than others, calculus unit one happens to be very, very long, but at the very, very end, you'll see something called progress check. Progress check has usually a well, choice part and a free response part. Remember, topic questions are formative assessments that are meant to be given as you teach each topic. So these topic questions assess this content with this skill. Progress checks are meant to assess all of the topics with all of the skills of the unit. Now, because unit one for calculus is really, really long, there's 16 topics and there's a ton of skills, the multiple choice section is broken up into three different parts. There's usually three questions for every topic. So that means there are about 48 multiple choice questions across the multiple choice section. So that you could give these in class over a 40 to 45 minute class period if you wanted to. They've been separated into three different parts. That the number of parts was determined by the typical pacing per question on the AP exam. So if you have longer class periods, like you meet for 90 minutes, you may want to give multiple parts at the same time. If you want to give these for homework, you could give all three parts at the same time if you wanted to. Free response parts, sometimes they are separated by timing, but sometimes they are separated by type of question. For something like calculus, you have a calculator active part and a non-calculator active part. I'll have you know that for this, one of the parts is calculator active, one of the parts is not, so that if teachers wanted to give them in class, they can have students have calculators out for one part, have them put them away for the other part. So you'll just have to kind of explore here. But the multiple choice parts, are, they look just like the topic questions. You'll be able to kind of click in here and you'll see all of the questions in the progress check part for calculus. All of the questions are discrete. In some of your courses, you may have sets of questions. You'll know that questions are related to the same set and share the same stimulus. If you'll see little connector lines in between questions, you'll know that they share the same stimulus. You can click from question to question if you want to see what the other questions are. You can jump around. Just like with the topic questions, you can expand and click on that side panel to see the correct answers and the rationales. You can also click on incorrect answers and see the rationales for why an answer is incorrect. You'll be able to see the alignments to different parts of the course framework, including the topic skill and learning objective and essential knowledge statements, along with other helpful information about whether or not a calculator is involved or other type of information as well, depending on the specifics of your course. And again, from here, you can do a couple of different things things. You can assign this multiple choice part from here. You can also view a scoring guideline. The scoring guideline for multiple choice is actually going to bring up a PDF document that will just have all of the questions in that part with the correct answers highlighted. It will not have uh, the rationale, but it will tell you if a calculator was required and give you the correct answer just highlighted. 
You can also look at the free response section. We can click on this and you can see this one has two questions. This is uh, no calculator is allowed for this question. So I would expect the other one to also be no calculator is allowed. That's correct. I will say for a lot of STEM courses, it's often difficult for students to type things in the box. So there is um, an image upload option. So students can do their work on paper and then they can click this button and then they will be shown a prompt to be able to type their answer in the box. We know that in a lot of STEM courses that may be a little bit more difficult with special characters. So students do have the option to upload and an image so they can do their work on paper, take a picture of it with a cell phone or a tablet, and then upload that picture so that teachers can actually see student work online and still score that work online so that the data is available online in AP class in AP classroom. And here, if you expand the right-hand panel. You don't get rationales because this is FRQ, but you will get scoring guidelines. And those scoring guidelines will tell you a little bit about how to score student responses, including what a student needs to do in order to earn the maximum score. In other words, in this particular case, in order to earn four points, a student needs to have done all four of the following criteria. Just like with the multiple choice, teachers can print the scoring guidelines. This will generate a PDF document and that will give you the question itself, all of the question parts, and then give you the scoring guidelines or the criteria for scoring each individual part of the question and what students had to show in terms of work in order to earn the maximum number of points for each one of those sections. There's a lot more we could show here, but we'll leave it at that. I will say that if you do want to learn a little bit more, I would encourage you to go up to the help menu here. If you click on the question mark, you can click on guide for teachers, and that will take you to the AP classroom guide for teachers where you can literally learn more about every single thing that we've talked about today, including learning more about AP daily videos, progress checks, and topic questions. As you can see, there's a lot of annotated screenshots in terms of how to navigate the system. So we'd encourage you to go there. There's so much we can show you, but we hope that this was very, very helpful in terms of telling you a little bit more about AP Daily videos, topic questions, and progress checks. We'll end our session by summarizing a few key takeaways that I hope you'll leave this session with. First of all, we hope that you're seeing that the resources within AP Classroom really do support all stages of teaching and learning within the instructional cycle. AP Classroom provides many resources to help students confront common misunderstandings and really persevere through challenging course content, starting from day one of the course and progressing all the way through exam day. These resources are really meant to help students learn and master valuable skills that are useful in their course, but also in all schoolwork and even beyond that, including time management, critical thinking, and independent study. Things like the rationales in the the topic questions and progress checks are really meant to help students take that ownership of their own learning and figure out where they need to spend more time and what one student needs to do may be different from what another student needs to do. An AP Classroom resource can kind of help students kind of work on their own and make those decisions for themselves. As a result, you know, AP Daily videos, topic questions, progress checks, and personalized feedback based on those rationales can help students hopefully feel ready and confident to register for and take that AP exam. That's the hope that students see that there is a wealth of resources to help guide them through the course and get them ready to take that AP exam so that they have a chance to earn college credit. And if you do want to point your students toward more information 
information about all sorts of AP topics, we would have you point them toward our student blog, which is really written in their voice and to give them a little bit more guidance on all things AP. There's the web page, or alternatively, you can just have them go to blog.collegeboard.org and click on AP, and they'll see a, a wealth of articles there on all things related to AP. One last resource for you. Most of the resources that we shared with you today were meant to help support your day-to-day -day instruction and day-to-day -day student learning in your classroom. But we also hear from AP teachers that students ask them a lot of questions about how to plan for what comes after high school. So we wanted to share one more resource to help you answer those types of questions, and that's Big Future. Big Future is a free online resource that helps students take the right first step after high school. That's whether they're interested in a four-year university, community college, or career training. Whatever they're interested in, Big Future can help them start planning. You can visit bigfuture.org slash educator, or you can scan the QR code that you see on screen to access resources that will make it easy for you to share information with your students or support planning activities either in class or after school when you meet with students. Students. When you connect students with Big Future and they complete college and career planning steps, they automatically earn entries for monthly drawings for $540,000 scholarships. So we hope that this is another resource that you can make use of and are able to share with your students. We thank you for joining us today, and we wish you a successful year ahead. We hope that you'll join us for our next session, and you watch the remaining of the sessions in AP Teacher Week. Thanks for joining. Hope to see you again soon.